Uh, good morning, and thanks so much to the organizers for inviting me here to speak and for all the magnificent Italian hospitality and care they've extended to all of us. I'm Chris High. I'm a teacher and sometimes a researcher and sometimes an activist. One of the things I've worked on for some time is the scholarship of PV. How do we understand and engage with the practice of PV as a scholar? Uh, before I start, I'd like to check, uh, do you have a crossword like this? Great. Um, do you need a pen? If you need a pen, uh, that's possible too. So, I work in a university in Sweden, so I'm from the north. But actually, I'm from the deep tropical south of Sweden, where it only goes to minus 15 or so in the winter. So I'm from the south of the north. I also live north of town, so I'm from the north of the south of the north. And before that, I lived in the West Midlands in the UK. So I'm also from the west of the middle of the south of Britain, which is in the west of Europe. And originally, I'm from South Africa. Um, and though the country is as far south as you can go in Africa, I grew up near Johannesburg, which is in the north of the country, on the East Rand. So I'm from the east of the north of the south of the south. I think you understand what I mean. Here in Milan, you're in southern Europe, which is part of the global north. So you're in the north of the south of the north. But are you south of the Alps, which is the middle of western Europe, <laughs> or north of the Mediterranean, which is, of course, the center of the world? It can be quite confusing, because where you are or where you're from all depends. Depends on who or what you're comparing with. Our position is re relational. It depends on how we choose from the set of choices we have available to us. Um, and my question is, how can we get our balance in this and find our way in relation to participatory video? I live in the forest, and some days when I've been traveling or working, I enjoy to come back and sit on the step of my cottage and just let everything else dissolve. After whatever chaos, I have a place where things make sense. I can hear the wind and see the sun or the stars or the rain. I enjoy the feeling of rootedness, smelling the smell of home. Plants growing and dying, and pure air like wine, and this time of year, the smell of mushrooms. In this talk, I want to see if we can follow the same logic in relation to participatory video, to look at the practice of PV in terms of a complex mass um, of viewpoints and relationships, and then look at how we can seek a satisfying and healthy simplicity uh, within all that complexity. Along the way, I'll show you a few pretty little films, because this is, after all, a festival. Um, but the point is, I'm just showing them for a discussion. This is, this is work I've brought here to make a, a discussion around. Um, this is some work by my students making participatory media while they learn about field work and some extracts from a longer piece made with teachers in two schools in Malawi. It might get a little complicated, but I hope that we follow the sunlight and the smell of mushrooms, we can get back to something that makes sense. Now I want to show you a short film, uh, the story of Omid. من از کشوری به نام افغانستان آمدم جایی که فقط جنگ، خونریزی، همه روزه زندگی کردن با سنتهای قدیمی و اسلامی برادر کشی را دیده ام. همین بس مهاجرتی را در پیش گرفته ام بسیار سخت و طولانی با مرگ و زندگی کردن مبارزه کرده ام به خاطر رسیدن به آرزوها به آرزوهایی که هنوز حسرت رسیدن به آنها در دلم مانده است با هزاران امید و در پی یک زندگی بهتر خودم را به سویدن رسانده ام پناهنده شده ام دفتر مهاجرت مرا به اوسیدا فرستاد جایی که از چهار سال به این سو زندگی می کنم تلاش می کردم تا زبان یاد بگیرم و با فرهنگ این کشور آشنا شوم که با خانمی به در اینجا آشنا شده ام وی وی نام دارد 88 سال دارد من 
مادر بزرگ صدایش می کنم اولین بار که دیدمش برایش مادر گفتم و او برایم مادر و هم خانواده هم شد مادری که همیشه آرزوی داشتنش در دلم مانده بود و هیچ وقت نداشتم مر و محبت این مادر باعث شد در خانهش بمانم همراهش به کلیسا رفتم وقتی برای اولین بار وارد کلیسا شده هم کشیشی را دیده هم که با احترام و مهربانی با من رفتار کرد و نظر من در وارد دین عوض شد و دین مسیحیت را انتخاب کردم اما امروز بعد از سپری کردن چهار سال در این کشور اداره مهاجرت از من می خواهد مادر بزرگم را با تمام رویاه هایی که اینجا ساخته ام رها کرده دوباره به افغانستان برگردم جایی که هیچ چیز و هیچ کس را ندارم Um, so at this point, whenever I show this film, the first thing I have to say is that Ahmed is still in Sweden. Uh, we met him uh, five days after he'd had a, a negative decision to stay, uh, and he appealed um, and was given permission to stay in Sweden where he still is. Uh, the story was made as part of a student project investigating the practical and emotional needs of migrants and refugees in a, commu a commune or a mun municipality called Upfadinga. Upfadinga is the size of Singapore, uh, but with a population of just 9,500 people. The local authority offered the project because they're very interested in the question of how to make the commune more attractive as a destination for new migrants to Sweden, because they see this as part of addressing the demographic issue that they have. We met Omid by accident when two Syrian Arabs who had agreed to come to a workshop to make digital stories didn't show up. And Omid came along with his friend, also an Afghan. He was very upset, obviously, but was very keen to tell his story. We had a Pashtun speaker amongst the students, and she worked on the story with him, and they recorded it. It was published the same day, something that Omid was very, very keen. He wanted to tell his story as soon as possible. The script of this film was part of his appeal, but I don't think it was decisive. I don't think the film itself figured, other than it was made, public, uh, made as a public statement uh, that he's now a Christian, potentially putting his life in danger if he was deported. I like to think it helped to clarify his relationship with Vivi and his active integration into the community. In some ways, it was a perfect digital story, a single narrative based on lived experience and told by the protagonist. It's quite a different production process than participatory video, but it has a nice combination of simplicity and power, and there are many things in common. Although the stories are individual, there's a group process in which everyone works on their story together. So how do we think about this? Uh, what is Omid's story? Is it a story to show at a PV festival? A successful appeal for asylum? a research project for students to learn methodology, a failure of scholarly objectivity, which I've been accused of it at at least one conference, or a contingent historical process with a range of different impacts, depending on your identity and your role in the work. I'd like to show you another one now. This is the story of Aida, one of my students. Determination. Growing up, I was always confronted with media, news images of starving and ill children from war-torn cities. I felt the pain the children felt, and I would always ask my mom why those children are suffering. My mom would explain to me that the world is a complicated place, and that the children aren't getting the help they need. It saddened me. I told my mom that I am going to be a doctor so that I can help them feel better. I was always a quick learner in school, and I had a huge interest in biology and chemistry. 
Getting good grades was never an issue for me. When it was time to apply for my high school program, my goal of becoming a doctor came to a halt. I began to have doubts. This was the first time I experienced anxiety. I was worried that I would have difficulties with math, and this consumed me. I was heartbroken that my lifelong dream of becoming a doctor would come to an end. I felt as if I wasn't good enough or smart enough. I decided to go with my second option, social sciences, to avoid mathematics. The breaking point came when my guidance counselor told me that with social sciences I would be able to work with global issues through many avenues like policy work or as a social secretary. I pursued high school and made new friends. One of my friends introduced me to the Peace and Development program at Linnaeus University, and I quickly became interested and found the motivation to apply. I was fascinated by the stories and experiences that the lecturers would share about their fieldwork. I felt like I can make a difference and my confidence grew. University life was filled with people from all around the world, bigger assignments and thicker books. I was taken aback, but I still decided to keep going strong. It wasn't until my methods course that I started to experience anxiety again, making me feel like I did when I chose not to go forward with my dream of becoming a doctor. My mind would freeze every time I opened my textbooks. There were even nights when I would cry because I felt like I couldn't grasp something so simple, while everyone around me would pass and move on with their lives. My anxiety overwhelmed me. I couldn't take anything in. I decided to leave my studies and I was offered a job to work with youth, remembering the helpless children in the media that I once was so distraught over as a child, I decided to make a difference there. I have helped children with despair and hopelessness regain a sense of belonging and a motivation to study to become whatever they want to be. This in the end has empowered me and made me regain my confidence. This year, I returned to my studies with great determination. With the help of family and friends and the knowledge I've gained from my job, I've come back ready to finally complete my master's studies without the anxiety and negativity that once held me back. I will now be able to accomplish my dream with the proper tools in hand to help change the world. And anytime I reach that dark hole again, I just breathe, take a step back and try to give myself the same advice that I would give the youth. You have come this far with your willpower. You are strong and only you can achieve your dreams. Nobody else can do it for you. By surrounding yourself with positive energy, you will be okay. Um, so this film was made during a training workshop for a course called Methods for Fieldwork, uh, which I run every year for our master's program in peace and development. Um, and the point is that the students should learn first to tell their own story before they can help other people to make th their stories. One of the side effects is that although this is well into the year of study, when I show these stories to my colleagues, we learn things about them. Um, very often we fall in love again, uh, that these students are magnificent that we want to support them and their life stories like this. Um, and so you have to separate out a little bit the learning experience from this kind of telling and falling in love as a teacher. It's, you know, they're two different things, but can they come together or not? In our subject, it's important that our students are able to work with communities and individuals from very different cultures and worldviews, um, and able to, first of all, to be open to their lives and experiences, and secondly, to think creatively about how to authentically represent that worldview within other frameworks uh, where the logic and values might be quite different. The Field Methods course is an opportunity to work with the students on that, to break them of academic habits of expertise and objective analysis, and instead to be able to work sympathetically from an intersubjective ontology, 
um, an intersubjective way of understanding how the world is created. Typically, a group of five students will engage with a brief negotiated with a local NGO um, or local government body, and then seek to investigate the views of some community in relation to the issue at hand. In terms of methods, I think of it as a jam sandwich. Uh, the bread is the solid staple of qualitative methods, interviewing with perhaps a bit of survey thrown in. The butter is participant observation, getting into a position to observe a subjective world in action. And the jam is, of course, to use participatory methods in a workshop to elicit a representation of that world that helps to demonstrate the lived truth of the community that the students encounter. And although in a sandwich the bread and the butter is very important, we usually name the sandwich after the jam. I've supervised 15 projects in the last four years like this, working with 10 different organizations, and now I'm starting to set up the ones for next February. There's no shortage of interest. Um, as our students are smart, and five of them working over five weeks can accomplish things that many organizations simply don't have the resources to even think about. So to give an example, one of these, um, uh, a project to investigate what young people want in an area called Arabi, a part of the city of Ekwa where I live, that is distinguished by low socioeconomic indicators and a large proportion of immigrants. Um, these descriptions uh, draw on a methodology for stakeholder analysis that I've developed based on Peter Checkland's soft systems methodology. So we can see this project, the ROB Youth Matters, um, as a course or practicum that enables students to develop their practical skills for working with people through engaging with a live project in a local society supported through training and tuition. This is the way that perhaps I think about it first. Another way of looking at it, a project to engage with the youth of Arabi to understand their perspectives about their lives and futures in order to express that perspective voice in public and inform the strategy of an organization called Dromanus Conteur, the Office of Dreams, and other local organizations as well as to address negative public perceptions about Arabi and the people who live there. Unfortunately, I don't have time to show you the film that they made because it's a bit longer. So that's the student perspective. And then you could look at it from a kind of a more human way as well. An opportunity for young residents in Arabi to be heard by a group of other young people who are interested in their lives and to observe and give or withhold permission for that perspective to be shared in public while having fun with people that they know. So this is the, the youth perspective. Can you see the way that there's different layers of meanings, whether you're north, south, or east, or west, depends on your own identity. So, now I'd like to explore with you a little bit what PV is, what is the essence of it? Um, and this will require some work on your part, but first I need to explain about cryptic crosswords. Uh, this is quite a British thing. Uh, you know what crosswords are, but in this case, the clues are written in a way that's very difficult to read. There's often lots of layers of meaning, and it takes a lot of work and intelligence to work out what the crossword uh, setter was trying to do. For example, uh, this clue across, nine across, uh, to tell a story, say, about a Belgian city. So, you know, Belgian city, Liege, but to tell a story, to lie, can you see the way that lie is in the beginning of the word? And I'm not very good at these. So the say probably relates to the GE, but I'm not sure how. Well, let's take another one. Shall we go to two down? Uh, a monster our team encounters upriver. Werewolf. So werewolf is the monster. Upriver, can you see the way that wolf, if you reverse it, it's flow. Wolf, flow. And so if you go up river, that's against the flow, basically. So you turn flow backwards. It's, it's, it's hard to do. My, my dad, my father, is much better at this than I am. So I'd like to tell you a story. Um, I used to commute. Uh, some days I'd have to get up at 5 a.m. and it would take me two or three hours to get to work. And I'd stay there for two or three days and then I'd come back. And so very often I'd be on the train early in the morning. Um, and once you're awake, it's difficult to settle back. 
And one day the coffee just wasn't working. I couldn't read. Um, and so I did the Sudoku because my brain works in a Sudoku way. That's, you know. And then that was finished and all I was left with was the cryptic crossword. So I started looking at it and I suddenly realized that I didn't have to follow the rules. That I could just write any word I like. So if you look at uh, eight down in the corner, I can fit damn. You know, subtle, in English this is a swear word but not a very strong one, like damn. And so I could just write damn and no one would know. Um, I could make up words. Uh, so in 13 down, I could put the word nopus, N-O-P-U-S, which doesn't exist. And the thing is, I could do this very quickly. And so I started filling it out, and, and it, 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 it began to wake me up. It was fun, uh, breaking the rules, because I looked very intelligent. I was doing the cryptic crossword at high speed. It was awesome at 5.30 in the morning. Um, and so I'd like to extend to you the opportunity to try this for yourselves. I would like you to start just spending a bit of time filling out words in any language you like and put words that don't exist and see if you can get them to fit together. The, the letters need to fit. Just write down and it should sound like a word is the only rule. It should be a word that you know, should feel like a word. But ideally, very quickly you'll be moving into making new words up. So have a go at that. One or two minutes. Just try. Okay, now if you haven't done it, make sure you have a few words that don't really exist. If you can't think of any, pretend that you're someone who can think of one, take that word and write it down. Okay, now I'd like you to find someone sitting near you that you don't know, or that you don't know very well. And I would like you to pick one of your words, one of you, one that doesn't exist, but that you have a good feeling about, that you kind of like the sound of it and the feeling of it. Just, just take one, and I would like you to try and persuade the other person that this is a dialect word from your home village, your home place, your hometown. <laughs> Have a go. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you have to stop. I know it's hard, you have to stop. <laughs> it's tough, um, but I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't given the five hours I'd really like to talk about this stuff with you. So I want to move on a bit, but you've done exactly what I wanted. That was perfect. Did you hear that sound? Yeah? You heard that sound? Da -da 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 -da. And I predict that the majority of you, if we left this to run for another 10 minutes, wouldn't be talking about the word anymore. You'd be talking about where you came from and your lives and it just has this organic nature to it based on the, the quality of that sound. That, that's my prediction. And for me, this is what participatory media does. The video is the crossword. It creates a space, an opportunity for discussion and encounter, for authentic sharing in a way that wouldn't have happened if I said, find someone in the room and talk to them. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's, it's a game that creates a new space. And the problem is that we tend to think of the video because it has this weight and importance. And sometimes not to pay enough attention to the creating space for the conversation. And I know because I've tried it, it's possible to do participatory video with no film in the camera if you're interested in this side as much as the film. So for me, uh, if we were to define participatory video, um, I like simple definitions. So making films with people instead of about them is very important. And always to remember that the film is not a film. The film is not just a film. That there's some other purpose usually. This is the P as well as the V. So now I'd like to 
show you another film. We have made a film, and this film is really a film that will educate a number of people and uh, making people know how education standards are in Malawi and how teachers are working, how uh, teachers, the community and the children are cooperating in the school activities. So this is a very good film that one has to watch. When we are teaching the learners, we need to involve the whole class to the lesson. It's not you teaching to them, but it's the learners who are doing what you want to teach. Yeah. Resources are very important in the process of teaching and learning because they motivate learners to be active in a class. So if learners are active, they gasp also information. We have all the extracurriculum activities. Uh, these activities include the, uh, sports activities, football and the netball. We have also what? Uh, sports. Uh, most of the learners come to school just for sports. Uh, the feeding program is going on well, uh, looking at the, the volunteers who come to prepare the porridge helps us, uh, they assist a lot uh, because the community provides those volunteers to come and prepare the porridge for the learners. In so doing, learners uh, in various classes, the moment has really increased because some of the learners, uh, they come from uh, poor villages, so they have an advantage to come to this uh, to school so that they should have at least something in the store. In that way, we, uh, we do develop ourselves professionally. When you upgrade yourself, uh, there is a great, great impact to the learners uh, in two ways. How you deliver the lessons it can be different from the way you were delivering the lessons before. That means you have widened your knowledge. So the delivery of the lessons will be again good. And even the feeling, the learners themselves, they do feel, you know, the, the learners themselves, they do rate as teachers. That one is a bit high and that one is a bit low. So when you upgrade yourself, uh, it will show that that one undergone other corridors of education. This film uh, will help a lot, uh, both uh, to the learners, uh, teachers, as well as uh, the community, because uh, the, they'll be looking at these films ever. So again, five hours or one hour, that's extracts. The full film is 20 minutes long. Um, it, I wanted to play the credits so that you could get, begin to get some idea of some of the relationships. This was made by a group of six teachers working with uh, a representative of an international NGO uh, and um, a staff member from the local partner NGO. Um, a friend of mine, the person who got me into participatory video, a participatory filmmaker, um, and two researchers, myself and uh, a young woman who I trained 10 years before this, before she'd even started her PhD. And this whole project started when she came to me now as a research fellow, an expert in education in sub-Saharan Africa. 
and said, um, I've always been thinking about that PV training. I'd love to be able to do it. Let's do a project. Um, and this is what we came up with. So there's some different ways to look at this whole exercise. And I'm going to try and use it to unpack some of the relationships between a community, uh, an organization or activist or um, a practitioner point of view, um, and, and research scholarship. So here's some different framings. For, for me, it was perhaps an opportunity to test some ideas about data analysis and the social affordances of different kinds of equipment. By social affordances, I mean the opportunities for social interaction, just like the crossword gives opportunities for different interaction. The affordance of the crossword game is conversation. Um, and so I was interested whether mobiles have different affordances than high-end uh, kit. Uh, for Alison, uh, the research fellow, an opportunity to develop a new stream of research that uses participatory video as a qualitative methodology to explore teacher preparation in sub-Saharan Africa. And in fact, this project was a pilot project and was used, amongst other things, to resource um, a large-scale bid um, and to get some of the partnership arrangements in place for that in Malawi. So being in Malawi for three weeks gave us a, a real opportunity to get to know people in a working relationship. And this is a much better way of uh, thinking about preparing um, a research bid. And for Catcher Media, a project to maintain the organization by doing important and interesting work outside of the normal sphere of practice, which is for them mainly based in the UK and usually with young people. So working with adults is different. Working in sub-Saharan Africa is different. Um, as it happens, uh, Rick, my friend, and his wife are in Mozambique right now in a, a new project with the same organization. So it's, in a sense, expanded their, their practice. For DAP, the local NGO, a validation of the NGO's approach to working with teachers and schools in order to build and maintain support for the organization's work to improve school and teacher preparation education in Malawi typical sort of NGO focus. They're trying to support teacher education. Uh, they have a particular approach and they want it through the medium of a film to be able to show that to the world. Uh, for the schools, another day in the ongoing work to mobilize resources through engaging in partnership with external organizations in order to serve the educational and other needs of the communities in which they're embedded. And we, in the first week that we went to visit these schools, were, I think, the third or fourth outsiders to come and visit the school that week um, to talk about some initiative or program. These schools are very, very good at mobilizing this kind of opportunity. Um, and in some ways, that's an ideal situation, a bit like uh, Tessa's indigenous community. It's more comfortable to work with a community that has the capacity to take what they need from a, a project like this. Um, for the teachers, an opportunity to engage with outsiders and upgrade themselves, that's a phrase that they use, in a tough environment which places many burdens and contradictions on them. Uh, teachers are expected to dress well, for example. Uh, typically in Malawi, they might not be paid three months in the year. It's quite difficult to dress well when you can't eat. So most of them are entrepreneurs on the side of teaching. Uh, for the teachers, another way to look at it, a platform to perform their role in the community as leaders and respectable people. And for the community, when we held that showing, some of the dancing was taken from um, an event at the end, an opportunity to celebrate and to support the schools as important local institutions. So again, you can see some of the layering of different things going on. And the question is how to bring them together so that they work well. Uh, this technique I've been using of using simple English sentences to represent uh, viewpoints or ways of thinking about it is some work I've been doing on stakeholder analysis. Uh, the references are here. And I think it, for what I'm really after is a heuristic, a procedure for discovery, for working out things that you don't know, that works with intersubjectivity, that works about the way that different subjective worlds come together. Uh, and it's based on earlier work by Peter Checkland. So what I've been working on for some time now is thinking about the different worlds that come together within this social space for social learning. Uh, for example, for researchers, um, there's a set of opportunities 
to do different kinds of research. You can do a research project and then feed into a participatory video project, a bit like the way I read Martin's work. He was working in research and there was an opportunity to kind of use this methodologically, but to, you know, based on the existing work already. Um, for a long time I did methodological research, so research on how to do participatory video, but I've become much more interested recently on the opportunities in my identity as a researcher to take part in this space um, and to think about the kinds of data that are generated. So this is from the Malawi project. A huge corpus of different kinds of information generated in three weeks. Um, part of the pilot study was to understand this. So for example, in one of the interviews, uh, the teachers began to speak about active learning uh, which has this kind of structure. Th these are causal claims about the relationships between active learning and some other things. And in the middle, one of the teachers began to talk about sports as active learning, and that evening the experts said he's made a mistake about seeing activity related to active learning, which is a concept, that, a pedagogical concept that the NGO is trying to promote. So we did some more interviewing. And it turns out that the teacher's concept of active learning is much richer. It includes the pedagogical idea, but for them it's about creating an active space in which learning can happen. And so activity, sports, is part of that. So is the feeding program. So is the relationship with the community. All these things come together. And so this is based on two or three interviews where I tried to look at these different factors. And the takeaway is that the, the lived experience, the practitioner point of view, is much stronger. The teachers knew what they were doing and we're able to integrate this active learning concept into a wider, maybe something like child-centered learning in the UK context. Um, and so I think participatory video as a research is a fantastic opportunity for participant observation. It's a very good opportunity for learning about power dynamics through action research, through doing. And I'm particularly interested now in, as a facilitator, when I try and get a group to think about something, when I get a resistance, that's very interesting because that tells me something I wouldn't necessarily be able to get through an interview. We don't want to do this, we don't want to think about this, you know, that, that's part of what I can study using participatory video in my research role. In terms of the practitioner or activist point of view, uh, I'm sort of beginning to work on this now. Um, obviously there's sort of livelihood and sustainability points of view. An organization needs to continue. As an activist or a practitioner, you need to be able to maintain your own position in the world. Uh, but there's also this notion of promoting social values. It's very much part of this world. And there's some interesting work by Tamara Plush uh, in a PhD three years ago on how participatory video practitioners work. Uh, focusing on PV and international development and seeking to understand different theories and practice of raising a voice. Uh, and she came up with this three parts uh, typology about amplified voice, engaged voice and equitable vo voice. Essentially what she found that different practitioners were trying to achieve slightly subtly different things in the world. And I think much more of this sort of research would be really helpful. Uh, to understand more about what practitioners are actually doing. In terms of the community, this is always a mess. <laughs> That's the whole point. I have a friend who calls this the local heuristic system, the system that is made up as it goes along and that's not so transparent. And one of the best uh, sets of practitioners in this context uh, is an NGO I worked with in India during my own PhD who were engaged to um, make an assessment of a minor irrigation scheme, of making small dams along the length of a, a watercourse and to talk to all the different communities about what they wanted. And one of the communities said, well, we want a school. <laughs> I mean, it still feels mad to me. It's, it's an irrigation scheme and they want a school. And the NGO was skilled enough and experienced enough to go back to the funders and say, if you want the irrigation work, you need to build a school in that village. And that's genius. I mean, that, that's an articulation of what the funder needs to build irrigation and what the community needs, a school, and there was a way found to put those together. And for me, that's the game. Is, 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 I don't think I can describe in general what communities want, but I'm interested in developing ways of exploring that in meaningful ways uh, that have an impact on what's done. 
Um, so in my own work with a colleague, uh, Gustav Nemes, um, we're interested in the local heuristic system within the framing of the, the project state and of practical heuristics of intersubjectivity. Other ways that have come in this, uh, in the academic literature, there's been a lot of interest in PV scholars in this notion of giving voice as a response to neoliberal um, oppression. And I've just started reading uh, Axel Honneth's work and phrases and so on, on recognition theory, which is really exciting because it's giving me a way of thinking about um, a historical grounded process um, in which recognizing others is part of the way that society develops. So for Maturana and Varela, um, love is a way out of subjectivity. We can experience others', others worlds when we appreciate them as the other. When you love someone, you stop projecting yourself on them and you start allowing them to be who they are. That's the essence of love that I'm after and from, from the study of Maturana and Varela. And Honneth, in the Ethics of Re Recognition, talks about different stages in which we can recognize the other. And the first step is set, sets in family and close relationships of love. This is the, the love that we have for our partner, for our parents, for our children, the commitment to them. And he, he talks about the way that this is grounded within the recognition around rights as citizens, that there's another layer and these kind of interpenetrate each other. And finally, building on the work of uh, George Mead um, uh, and, and various others, the notion of solidarity, of recognizing the others based on shared values which we develop as we go along. And I think this gives a very interesting underpinning to the way that we can work with communities and seeing how we develop a shared framework uh, that's not already there, that provides us the basis to recognize one another um, as human beings. So in terms of bringing it all back together again, um, for me, there's a few things that are worth thinking about. Uh, and this is where the ideas are just going to fly and whatever sticks, sticks. Um, so one idea is to see that in terms of knowledge, relationships are part of the knowledge that's produced by a project. New relationships, new understandings of each other, because what I know is shaped by who I know. And if I know new people, then what I know and what I can do is different. And I think we can start to think about the outcomes of our projects in that sense, as well as the film. I'm very interested in bricolage, in the putting together of old things uh, into new forms. You know, how do we take the idea of filmmaking and turn it into social activism? And one of the ways for me into this is a notion from French cinema of auteurship. So French uh, cinema theorists started in the 60s to talk about the idea that maybe the main creative voice in the film wasn't the person who wrote the script, but rather the director. Um, and you can extend this and see that in a film you have a multiple authorship. And that essentially, there's a set of places in which people can take creative control, that we can have a director, an editor, a script writer, a camera operator. You can even creatively do lighting. And that in relation to this being participatory within a social process, we can bring people in to take authorship, a sense of creative control, without necessarily having to be the editor. For example, the practice of my friend Rick is often to do the edit with a group of people standing behind him in the role of a director, telling him how they wanted it edited. And the relationship is just like an editor and a director. I think this might work, and the director goes, no. Or yes, or you know, it's it's a different model than the people should edit. One of the ways of doing this is to stop thinking about a logic of intervention of changing a community, but instead to think about it as invitation, about creating a context in which I can ask a group or individuals or community, would you like to do this? And if the politics are such that they can genuinely say no that the decision is theirs, then that's a good context for participatory action. Um, and this, I think, in the end, gives scope for authenticity. For um, when people control their own film, this can be experienced by them, 
And I think it shows through. I think the films that are made like this, we experience is more authentic in a sense. So to finish, um, these are the mountains between Albania and Montenegro and where I went walking earlier this year. A place where I found happiness and my mountain soul that I'd lost for 20 years and had been missing. I'm going back next year with my students as the hiking trail I was on is also a peace and development sub, um, project. It's part of my subject. And so I can spend a month in the mountains while they get on with their thesis research and maybe I can do some walking. When I started out this enterprise of studying PV as a researcher 20 years ago, it was true that there was very little written about PV. Three books and parts of two others. A master's thesis and a research article in feminist geography. A massive practice but very little scholarship. I think that's transformed now. I think that the enterprise of being scholars around this, a group of us have been able to start to think and write about this in a scholarly way. And some very exciting work being done on all sorts of topics. But there's still a long way to go. Hannah suggests we can build solidarity on a bed of shared values, and this requires a struggle to establish the nature of those values. I think we've made progress in this within the participatory video practitioner community, within the scholarly community, within those set of overlapping identities. But there's still some way to go with questions like whether this is a critical or a radical project. It's going to be a long uphill journey, but just think about the view. So I'm looking forward to the journey, and it looks to me on the basis of this conference that I'm in very good company, and I invite you to come along with me. <laughs>